one of the weird things is that um, about podcasts is that as far as I can tell, the average podcast interviewer uh, is far more knowledgeable and uh, thoughtful than the average sort of mainstream uh, journalist um, interviewer it had. I, I just find that amazing. I don't, under uh, don't understand it. So I think you guys should be hired by the, uh, you know, they should switch roles or something. <laughs> yes, there's this thing that I think is not stressed enough in history, which is that often the elites kind of recognize each other and uh, they, they, they join up um, in arrangements that increase both of their power and, you know, exploit the, uh, the, the poor schmucks down below. And that's exactly what happened in with the East India Company, and it's exactly what happened with, with, with Spain. Science and technology properly applied can allow you to produce your way out of these environmental dilemmas. You turn on the science machine, essentially, and we can, you know, we can escape these kind of um, dilemmas. And the prophets say, no, that there's, there's, there, there, natural systems are governed by um, laws, um, and there's an inherent carrying capacity or limits or planetary boundaries. Okay. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Charles Mann, who is the author of three of my favorite books, including 1491, New Revelations of America Before Columbus, 1493, Uncovering the New World Columbus Created, and The Wizard and the Prophet, Two Remarkable Scientists and Their Dueling Vision to Shape Tomorrow's World. Charles, welcome to the Lunar Society. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. My first question is, how much of the new world was basically baked into the cake? So at some point, people from Eurasia were going to travel to the new world and they were going to bring their diseases. And, uh, at, you know, because of disparities in where they would survive, if the Asimoglu theory that you cite is correct, then at some of these places were bound to be better, have good institutions. Some of them were bound to have bad institutions. And all, all because of malaria... There were going to be shortages in labor that people would try to fix with um, African slaves. So how much of this was just bound to happen? If, if Columbus hadn't done it maybe 50 years down the line, somebody from you know, Italy does it, like, what is the contingency here? Well, I think some of it was baked into the cake. It was pretty clear that you know, sometime people from Eurasia and uh, people from the Western Hemisphere were going to come into contact with each other. I mean, how could that not happen, right? And there was a huge epi epidemiological disparity between the two hemispheres, um, largely because by a quirk of evolutionary history, there were many more domesticable animals um, in Eurasia in the Eastern hemisphere. And that led almost inevitably to the creation of zoonotic diseases, diseases that start off in animals and jump the species barrier and become human diseases. And most of the great killers um, in human history are that kind of disease. So they're gonna meet there's going to be those kinds of um, diseases. But, you know, it's possible to uh, imagine, you know, if you wanted to some, you know, alternative histories, there's a wonderful um, uh, book by Laurent Binet uh, called Civilizations that, in fact, just does that. It's a great alternative history uh, book. And he imagines that some of the Vikings came and they actually extended further into um, North America than they did. And they brought the diseases so that by the time of Columbus and so forth, the, the epidemiological balance was different. Um, and what happened was that they, uh, when Columbus and those guys came, these uh, societies killed him, grabbed his boats, and went to and went to Europe, and the Inca conquer <laughs> Europe in this. And you know, it's 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 far fetched, but it does say that that even th this encounter will happen, and the diseases will happen, but it doesn't happen to happen in the way that they that they did. You know, it's perfectly possible to imagine again that uh, Europeans didn't engage in wholesale slavery. Uh, there was a huge debate, you know, when this began about whether this was a good idea or not, and uh, you had a lot of uh, reservations, uh, particularly among the uh, the Catholic monarchy, uh, sort of asking the Pope, is it okay that we do this? And, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the penny uh, dropping in a, in, a, in a slightly different way. Uh, so some of it was, I think, going to happen, I think, uh, but, but, you know, how exactly it happened is, is really up to chance and contingency and human agency. Uh, when, I guess in the 15th and 16th century, when um, w w when the Spanish first arrived, were the Incas and the Aztecs, were they at a particularly weak point or particularly decadent? Or was this just where you should have expected that civilization? Like th this was basically how well it would have been functioning at, on any given time period. Well, typically um, empires are much more, you know, sort of jumbly, fragile 
um, entities than we, we, we kind of imagine. And there's always you know, fighting at the top. And what uh, Cortez was able to do, for instance, with the, with the Aztecs, the Triple Alliance, the tri they're better called the Triple Alliance. Aztec is a invention from the 19th century. Um, and that was three uh, groups of people in central Mexico, the largest of which were the Mexica, who had the great city of Tenochtitlan. But there are other two guys who are a member of this really resented them. They were the you know, superior guys. And what Cortez was able to do was to foment a civil war within the Aztec um, empire and, uh, uh, and to take some of the enemies of the Aztecs and some of the members of the Aztec empire and create an entire new order. And there's a fascinating set of um, history that hasn't really uh, I think emerged into the popular consciousness. Certainly, it was new, and I didn't include it in 1491 or 1493 because it wasn't. Uh, it was it was so new that it, I didn't know anything about it. Largely Spanish and Mez, uh, Me and Mexican scholars about the conquest within the conquest, and so the allies of the Spaniards, um, Tlaxcalan, Tlatelco, and so forth actually sent armies out and conquered big swaths of northern and uh, southern Mexico and, cent and, and Central America. And so there is a, you know, a far more complex uh, picture than we realized even, even 15 or 20 years ago when I first published uh, uh, 14, 1491. So in that sense, yes, but the, also the conquest wasn't as complete as we, as we think, because what happened is Cortez moves in and what he does is he marries, I talk a little bit about this in 1493, he marries his lieutenant into these, um, you know, these these indigenous things, and creating this hybrid uh, nobility that then extends on to the to the Inca. So interesting. And the same thing for the Inca. It's a it's a very powerful but also unstable empire. And Pizarro has the luck to walk in right after a civil war. And uh, when and when he does that, and uh, right after civil war and massive epidemic, he gets them at a, at a very vulnerable point. But again, it all would have been impossible. Pizarro cleverly uh, allies with the losing side, or the apparently losing side in the in in the civil war, and is able to um, sort of create a new rallying point, and they attack the, the the winning side. So he's, you know, so you have, yes, they uh, came in at weak points, but empires typically have these weak points um, because of fratricidal stuff going on in the in, in the leadership. Yeah, yeah, it does remind me also of you know the East India Trading Company. And oh yeah. The and the Mughal Empire, sure. yes, exactly. and the, the Mughals. Yeah. Some of those guys in Bengal invited uh, Clive and his guys in. And in fact, I was struck by this. Uh, I've just been reading this uh, book. You must uh, maybe you've heard of it, "The Anarchy" by William Dalrymple. I started reading it, but it's I amazing. Made that it's, progress. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, book, and it's so oddly similar to what happened. There's this fratricidal stuff going on in the Mughal Empire, and one side thought oh, we'll get these foreigners come in and we'll use them. <laughs> and that turned out to be a big mistake. Yes. Uh, what's also interestingly similar is the efficiency of the bureaucracy in the sense that uh, Neil Ferguson has a good book on uh, the British Empire. And one thing he points out is that in India, the ratio between an actual English civil servant, I mean, you can call them what, uh, something else maybe, but and the actual Indian population was, I think, one to three million at the peak of the ratio, and which obviously is uh, only possible if you have cooperation of at least the elites, right? Yeah. It sounds similar to what you were saying with Cortez marrying his underlings right. to the nobility. Yes, there's this thing that I think is not stressed enough in history, which is that often the elites kind of recognize each other and uh, they, they they join up um, in arrangements that increase both of their power and, you know, exploit the, uh, the the poor schmucks down below. And that's exactly what happened in with the East India Company. And it's exactly what happened with with, with Spain. And it's not so much uh, that the you know, that there's this amazing efficiency. It's that uh, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement for the, uh, for the, and then Tlaxcala, um, which is now a Mexican state, wasn't really fully part of, you know, it was, it had its rights. The people kept their uh, integrity. They were not part of the, the Spanish empire. And it really wasn't part of Mexico until I think it's 1857 or something like that. Wow. I mean, it was a good deal for them. And the same thing was true for the Bengalis. They did, they've made out like bandits from the, uh, the, the elites <laughs> did from the, uh, from the British empire. Yeah. That's super interesting. 
Um, why was there only one successful slave revolt in the New World in, in Haiti? Like, why why didn't why weren't this, in many of these cases the ratios between slaves and the owners is just you know it's 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 uh, it's huge. So why weren't more of them successful? Well, I guess you would have to say you know define successful. Um, you know, uh, Haiti wasn't successful if you meant creating a prosperous. Uh, yeah. state that would last for a long time. I mean, Haiti, right. uh, partly, be, you know, uh, to no small um, you know, extent because of the you know, incredible blockade that was put on it by all the other nations was, it was and is, you know, in, in terrible shape. Um, whereas there were, um, you know, things like Palmares, where you had, you know, for more than 100 years, uh, you know, people who are self-governing. Now, eventually, they were incorporated into um, the larger project of, of, of Brazil. But you could also point out that uh, there's a great, um, a great Brazilian sort of you know classic like Moby Dick or or, or Huck Finn is to the U.S. is this thing uh, called um, Osho Toys uh, by a guy named Dacunha. And it's, it's translated, it's an amazing translation, very good translation um, in English to under rebellion in the backlands. And what it is about is in the 1880s, the creation of a hybrid state of you know, runaway slaves uh, uh, and so forth and how they had essentially kept their independence uh, and lack of supervision informally uh, from the time of col uh, colonialism, and now the new British state, uh, excuse me, new Brazilian state is trying to, you know, take take control, and they fight them, you know, to the last person. And so you had these effectively independent areas, you know, not in not uh, de facto, if not de jure, um, that existed in uh, the Americas for a very long time. And there are some in the, the U.S. too, in the Great Dismal Swamp. And you hear about those maroon com communities in North Carolina. And uh, there are certainly ones in, in Mexico where everybody just agreed these places aren't actually under our control, but we're not going to say anything. And if they don't mess with us too much, we won't mess with them too much. So, you know, is that successful or not? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but it seems like uh, these are temporary successes. There's uh, how long do if, nations if last? Correctly, how long do nations last? I mean, that's yeah, true, right? The like Genghis Khan. How long did the, did the Khanate last? <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. It was pretty. It Fair had enough. some impact. Yeah. So I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And and they, they basically yeah. they had overwhelming odds against them. Um, you know, the, there is a an entire colonial system that was threatened by their existence, and uh, for you know the same reason that. Uh, you know, rebellions in um, South Asia were, you know, in suppressed with incredible brutality uh, is because it was seen as so profoundly threatening to this entire uh, colonial order that people um, exerted a lot more force against them than you would think would be worthwhile. Right. It's, it sounds, it reminds me of um, James Scott's thing in Against the Grain, mm -hmm. where he pointed out there were, if you look at the history of agriculture, there's many uh, examples where people just like choose to run away yeah. and live as foragers in the forest. And then uh, the, the, the state tries to bring them back into the fold. Right. And so this, yes, exactly. This is part of that uh, dynamic. A certain number of people, you know, who wants to be a slave, right? And as many people as possible leave. And um, it's easier in some places than others. It's very easy in Brazil. And so all these, uh, there's 20 million people in the Amazon or, you know, the in Brazilian Amazon, something like that. And the great bulk of them are the descendants of people who left slavery and they're, you know, they're still Brazilians oh, wow. and, and so forth, but you know, they, they ended up not being slaves. Yeah. That's super fascinating. What is the explanation for why slavery went from being obviously uh, historically ever present, but also at a particular time it ended up being at, at its peak in terms of value and usefulness. What's the explanation for like, you know, Britain bans the slave trade and within like a hundred, 200 years, there's basically no legal sanction for slavery anywhere in the world. This is a really good question. And the answer, so the, the, the real answer is historians have been arguing about this forever. I mean, not forever, but, you know, for, for, for decades. And there's a bunch of different explanations. And the reason I think that it's um, so hard to pin down is it's, it's kind of so amazing. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, uh, in 1800, you know, if, if you were to have a black and white map of the world and to put 
uh, red in countries in which slavery was not legal and socially accepted, there would be no red anywhere in, on, on the planet. I mean, it was it was like the most ancient human institution that there is. The Code of Hammurabi, which I think is still the oldest complete legal code that we, we have, about a third of it is about, you know, the rules for, you know, when you can buy, when you can sell, how you can mistreat, how you can't, you know, you know right. all that stuff. It's about a third of it is about buying and selling and working other human beings. Um, and so this thing has been going on for a very, very lo long time. And then in a century and a half, um, it suddenly changes. So there's some explanation. Machinery gets better. And so the reason to have people is that you have these um, intelligent autonomous uh, workers who are like the world's best robots. Um, you know, if you, from the point of view of the of the, the the owner, they're fantastically good, except they're incredibly obstreperous, and they're con you're you're constantly afraid they're going to kill you. So if you have a chance to replace them with machinery or to create a wage uh, in which are run by wage people, uh, pay, wage workers who are um, you know, kept in bad conditions, but are somewhat have uh, more legal rights, maybe that's a better deal for you. Um, another one is that um, the, there were the industrialization produced different kinds of commodities that became more and more valuable and slavery was typically associated with agricultural labor. And so as agriculture diminished as a part of the um, economy, slavery became less and less important and um, it became easier to get rid of them. Another one has to do with the you know, collapse, the beginning collapse of the colonial order. I think that uh, part of it has to do with um, just a, in, at least in the in the West, and I, I don't know enough about the East. It's just you know to to say, but you have the rise of an abolition, a serious abolition movement with people like Wilberforce and you know various Darwins and and so forth, and they're incredibly in, in influential. And to some extent, I I think people started saying, "Wow, this is really bad." And uh, I suspect that if you uh, looked at um, South Asia and, and Africa, you might see similar uh, things, you know, having to do with a social uh, moment. I, I, I just don't know enough about that. Uh, I know there's an anti-slavery movement and anti, you know, caste movement, and which are all tangled up in, in South Asia, but I just don't know enough about it to say anything intelligent. Yeah, yeah. The, the social aspect of it is really interesting because the, the, the things you mentioned about like automation and industrialization making slavery done obviously by the time that, that might have explained why it expanded but the its original inception in britain like that that was before the industrial revolution took off so that was purely them just taking a huge loss in or because this this movement took hold and the same right? thing is true is for it, las casas i mean las casas you know in the 1540s sort of comes out of nowhere and uh, starts saying hey this is bad. <laughs> and um, he is this predecessor of the modern uh, human rights movement. Uh, and yeah. uh, is, is an absolutely extraordinary figure. And he has huge amounts of influence. And he causes Spain in the 1540s to pass, you know, the king to pass what they call the new laws, which is says no more slavery, which is a devastating blow, you know, if it had been enacted to the uh, to the colonial economy in, in Spain, because they that all depended on having slaves to work in the mines, the silver mines in uh, the northern half of Mexico and um, in uh, Bolivia, and which was, you know, the most important part of not only the Spanish colonial economy, but the entire Spanish empire. It was all slave labor. Um, and they actually tried to ban it. Now, you know, you could say they came to their senses and found a workaround in, in which it wasn't banned. But it was still, you know, this actually happened in the 1540s, largely because people like Las Costas said, this is bad. You're going to hell. <laughs> You're doing this, right? I'm I'm super fast, uh, interested in discussing with you uh, once we get into the Wizard and the Prophet section. How, how movements, like for example, environmentalism, has been hugely affected. Oh yeah. Again, even though um, it, it probably goes against the the maybe the, the naked self interest of um, many countries. So I'm, I'm I'm very interested in discussing with you at that point about why these movements have been so influential. Um, but, but, but let me, let me continue asking you about, uh, the, the globalization of the new world. So I'm really interested in why you think, uh, how you think about contingency in history, especially given that you have these two groups of people that are separated by tens of thousands, uh, that have been independently evolving for tens of thousands of years, what things turn out to be contingent and what things are 
both of them end up doing you know what i found really interesting from the book was both of them develop uh, like pyramids right like this structure like who would have thought that just like in, within our ge uh, uh, extended phenotype or something but uh well, it's also geometry i mean there's only a certain limited number of ways you can pile up stone blocks uh, uh you know in a, in a in a stable way and uh pyramids are, are are certainly are certainly one of them it's harder to have a very long lasting monument that's a cylinder um and I see. and so pyramids kind of are are and also they're easier to build as you get a cylinder you have to have a scaffolding around it and that gets harder and harder pyramids you can use each lower step to put the next one on and uh, and and so forth so pyramids seem kind of natural to 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 me now what you make them of is going to be partly determined by what there is and so um, in Cahokia and uh, in the Mississippi Valley, there isn't a whole lot of stone. Um, so people are going to make these earthen uh, pyramids. And there's going to be, if you want them to stand for a long time, there's certain things you have to do for the structure in which people figure out. Um, same way for the pyramids, you had all this, I guess you, and it, you had all this marble around. <laughs> and so you could make these uh, things with giant slabs of marble, which seems uh, today, from today's perspective, incredibly wasteful. So you, so yeah, so you're going to have some things that are universals uh, like that, and along with the apparently universal uh, or near universal idea that people who are really powerful like to identify themselves as, as supernatural and therefore want to be commemorated. Hmm. Um, yes, I visited Mexico City recently, mm -hmm. and then I got a chance. A beautiful to check city. Out, um, yeah, yeah, the the, the, the pyramids there. Um, and, you know, what struck me was that, you know, I think I was reading your book at the time or had read your book. And so if I remember correctly, they didn't have the wheel, right? Yeah. And obviously they didn't have uh, domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. And so this whole thing, if you think about it, is really d the amount of human misery and toil that it must have taken to put this thing together as basically a vanity project. Um, it, it, if, I don't know. It's like a, maybe has a negative connotation if if you think about what it took to construct it. Sure, um, but you know one of the really interesting things about Teotihuacan, um, and then, you know again, this is just one of those things that you can only say so much in one book. And if I was writing the two thousand page version of fourteen ninety one, I would have included this. So Teotihuacan pretty much stand, starts out as a standard imperial project, and they build all these you know huge castles and uh, temples and 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 so forth. And there's no reason to suppose it was anything other than you know like building the pyramids. You know, an awful experience of all. But then something happens to uh, Teotihuacan. We don't understand why. After that, more or less all these new buildings spring up in the next couple hundred, hundred years and they're all very very similar they're like apartment blocks and there doesn't seem to be a great separation between rich and poor and um it's really quite striking how egalitarian the architecture is and that's usually that's usually thought to be a reflection of uh of social status so it looks like there you know could there have been a political revolution of of some sort they create, you know, something, uh, you know, something much more egalitarian, probably with kings, but, a, you know, a bunch of good guy kings who aren't, <laughs> aren't interested in elevating themselves so much. Now, it isn't. Uh, and there's a whole chapter in uh, the book by David uh, Wengro and David Graeber, The Dawn of Everything, about this. And they, they make this argument that, uh, that you know, Tenochtitlan is, uh, uh, Teotihuacan, excuse me, is... Um, you know, an example that we can look at of an ancient society that was, you know, much more socially egalitarian than we think. Um, now, they, in my view, go a little overboard. It was also an aggressive imperial power and it was conquering, you know, uh, much of the Maya world at the same time. But it is absolutely true that uh, something that started out one way starts looking very differently uh, quite quickly. And you see this uh, lots of times in the in in the Americas. Um, in the Southwest, um, you you I don't know if you've ever been to like Chaco Canyon or any of those those places. Can't tell you. You should absolutely go. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to get there because of the roads terrible and so forth. It's totally worth it. It's an amazing place. And Mesa Verde, right north of it, is incredible. It's just really a, a, a fantastic thing to see. And there's these enormous structures there in Chaco Canyon um, that, if they were anywhere else, we would call them castles. They're huge. They have like eight. One of the, the biggest one, Pueblo Bonito, has like 800 rooms or some insane number like that. And um, you know, it's clearly an imperial venture.
Um, and then we know that on, it's in this canyon and on one side getting the good light and good sun is all these huge, there's a whole line of these huge castles. And on the other side is where, you know, the peons lived. Um, we also know that uh, starting, you know, around 1100, everybody just left. Uh, and then their descendants start the Pueblo, who are this sort of uh, intensely socially um, egalitarian uh, type of people. And it looks like a political revolution um, took, took place. And in fact, in the book I'm now writing, I'm arguing that, uh, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, but also seriously, that this is the first American revolution. It's, uh, they got rid of this, uh, <laughs> these, these guys or kings, you know, or something and, uh, and, uh, created these very different and much more egalitarian, uh, societies in which ordinary people had a much larger uh, voice in what went on. Interesting. Um, but I wonder, I think I got a chance to see the uh, Teotihuacan um, apartments uh, when I was there. And I wonder if that the f we're just looking at the buildings that survived and the buildings that survived are maybe like better constructed because they were for the um, for like the, 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 those were the buildings for the elites. Right. And then so like the, where everybody else lived, it, it just might have just washed away over the years. So what's happened in the last 20 years is then, you know, basically much more uh, sophisticated surveys of, of what, what is there. I mean, what you're saying is that the absolutely the right question to ask, you know, are the rich guys, the, you know, uh, the only things that survived and the ordinary people didn't. And you can never be absolutely sure of that. But what they have done is the kind of LIDAR and ground penetrating uh, radar sur surveys. And it looks like this sort of more egalitarian construction extends for a huge distance. And so it's possible that there's even more really, really poor people with the thing, but at least you see the, you know, uh, an aggressively large quote unquote middle class uh, getting there, which is very, very different than the kind of uh, picture you have of the ancient world in which there's the sun priest or somebody, and then all the peasants around there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but by the way, are, are, is the thesis of the new book something you're willing to disclose at this point? Sure, sure. Totally okay, if you're not okay. Okay, so the, the the this is sort of a it's like a sequel or something or offshoot of 1491. And that book, um, I'm embarrassed to say, was supposed to end with another chapter, and that chapter is going to be about the American West, which is where I grew up, and you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm very fond of it. And apparently, I had a lot to say because when I outlined the chapter. The actual the outline was way longer than the actual completed chapters of the rest of the book. And I sort of tried to chop it up and so forth. And it just was awful. And so I just cut it. And if you carefully um, look at 1491, it, it doesn't really have an ending. It's just got at the end, the author sort of goes, hey, I'm ending. Look at how great this is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so and this has been bothering me for 15 years. And so during the pandemic, uh, you know, when I was stuck at home and uh, like like so many other people, I, I, I hauled out what I what I had, and I've been saving string and you know just tossing articles that I came across into a folder. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write this out more seriously now. You know, 15 or 20 years later, and um, and then it was it was pretty long. I thought maybe this could be an ebook, and I showed it to my editor, and he said that is not an ebook. That's an actual book. So, <laughs> so I've taken a chapter and I hope I just haven't padded it. Um, and it's about the North American West. And the, the something I've added is uh, uh, thinking about it is, uh, you know, uh, my, my kids like the West. And at various times they've they've said, you know, what would it be like to move out there? Because I'm in Massachusetts uh, where they, they grew up. And um, so I start thinking about what is the West going to be like tomorrow? You know, in, in you know when I'm not around 30 or 50 years from now, and it seemed to me that you, you, we won't know who's president or who's governor or anything, but there's some things we uh, can know. It'd be just a, really a surprise if it isn't you know hotter and drier than it is now, or it has been you know in the re recent past. That would just be a, really a surprise. So I think we can say that's very likely to be like that. Um, it would be a surprise if it wasn't. Um, you know, the, all the projections are that something like 40 percent of the people. Um, in the area between the, the Mississippi and the Pacific will be of, um, you know, Latino descent, uh, you know, from, from, from the South, so to speak. Um, and there's a whole lot of people um, from Asia, um, you know, along the Pacific coast. So it's going to be a real mixing ground, uh, ethnic mi mixing ground. Um, and then the, there's going to be a center of energy, sort of no matter what happens, you know, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's petroleum, you know, uh, uh, hydroelectric, 
the West is 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 it's going to be economically extremely powerful because energy is sort of the fundamental you know a fundamental industry. And the last thing is, and this is the most iffy of the whole thing, but I'm going to go out on a limb and do this is uh, say that the ongoing recuperation of sovereignty by the 294, I think, uh, federally recognized Native nations in the in the West is going to continue. And uh, but that's been going in this very jagged way. But definitely for the last 50 or 60 years, you know, as long as I've been around, um, it's the, the overall trend is in a very clear direction. And so then you think, OK, so this West is going to be wildly ethnically diverse, full of uh, competing sovereignties and overlapping uh, sovereignties. And nature is going to really be in kind of a turmoil. Well, that actually sounds like the 1200s. And uh, <laughs> the conventional history starts with Lewis and Clark and so forth um, and sort of says that there is this break point in, in history uh, when, you know, when people look like me uh, came in and sort of rolled in and they roll in from the east and kind of take over everything. The West disappears, the separate entity, Native people disappear, nature is tamed. And that's pretty much what was in the textbooks when I was a kid. It was in, you know, do you know who Frederick Jackson Turner is? Um, no. So he's like one of these guys who nobody knows who he is, but was incredibly influential in setting intellectual ideas. He he uh, uh, wrote this article in 1893 called The Significance of the Frontier. And it was the thing that established this idea that there was this frontier moving from east to west. And on this side was, you know, savagery or barbarism. And on this side was civilization and tame nature and wilderness and all that. And it goes to the Pacific. And then that's the end of the West. And that's still in the textbooks, you know, in different form. Uh, you know, we don't call Native people lurking savages like he did. Um, you know, <laughs> that, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, but it's in my kids' textbooks. It's probably, if you have kids, if you, it'll very likely be in their uh, textbooks. It's such a bedrock thing. I'm saying, that's actually not a useful way to look at it, given what's coming up. And uh, there's a wonderful Texas writer, Bruce Sterling, who uh, says, uh, you know, to know the past, you first have to understand the future. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and what he means is, I mean, it's, it's funny, right? But, it, but what he means is, you know, all of us have an idea of where the trajectory of history is going. And a whole lot of history is saying, how did we get here? How did we get there? And to get that, you have to have an idea of what the there is to, to do this. And so I'm saying I'm writing a history of the West with that West, you know, the, uh, that I talked about in mind. And that gives you a very different uh, picture. A um, lot more about, uh, you know, indigenous fire management and uh, the way the Hohokam survived the drought of the 1200s um, and, and a little bit less about Billy the Kid. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, speaking of the frontier, maybe maybe it's a mistaken concept, but I mean, let, 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 let's just stick with that for a second. I, I'm curious if you think that, okay, so if you, I remember the chapter of 1493 where you talk about, you know, these rowdy adventurous men who way outnumbered the woman in the silver mines mm -hmm. and the kind of trouble that they cause. I wonder if there's some sort of distant analogy to... Um, the technology world or Silicon Valley, um, yeah. where, where you have the same kind of gender ratio, you have the same kind of frontier spirit, uh, maybe not the same kind of like physical violence, but Let's hope. <laughs> sociologically, yeah. sociologically, is there any similarity there? I think it's funny. I hadn't thought about it, but uh, so, um, but it, it, it's certainly funny to, to, to think about. So let, let me do this sort of off the top of my head. And then with the idea that if, uh, if I start saying, if I, I, with the idea that it, at the end of it, I can say, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. Um, both of them would attract people who either didn't have much to lose or were oblivious about what they, what, what, what they, they, they had to lose and kind of had a resilience towards failure. I mean, it's amazing the number of people in Silicon Valley who have like completely failed at, uh, at numbers of things and just keep, get up and keep, uh, keep, keep trying and have a, a kind of real obliviousness to, uh, to, to social norms. And um, it's pretty clear and, and are very much interested in making a mark and making you know their their fortunes themselves so there's a you know at least in you know in this sort of shallow comparison there's a there, there's there, there's some certain uh, similarities and i don't think this is entirely flattering to either groups um <laughs> <laughs> you know it is absolutely true that those silver miners in um in in bolivia and in northern northern mexico you know created 
you know, to a large extent, the, the modern, modern world. But it's also true that they created these sort of cesspools of violence and ex ex exploitation that, 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 you know, that we're, that we're still, uh, whose consequences we're still living with uh, today. So you have to kind of take the bitter with the sweet. And I, I think that's true of, of Silicon Valley and it's, it, it's, it's, its products that I, I use them every day and I curse them every day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I want to go give you an example. I'll give, give you an example. Uh, in my own uh, okay. thing, the uh, the the internet has made it possible for me to do something like you know have a Twitter thread and have millions of people read it and you know and have a discussion. And that's really amazing. At, at the same time, yet today the Washington Post is uh, has a has an article about how every book in I. I think it's Texas. It's one of the states um, uh, that that a child checks out of the school library goes into a central state data bank, and um, you know, and they can see and look for patterns of people taking out bad books and uh, this sort of stuff. And I think, like, whoa, that's really bad. <laughs> that, that's not so good. And it's really the same technology that it, you know, this dissemination and collection of information, vast amounts of information, with relative ease. So. Right, all of these things you take the bitter with the sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you again about the contingency thing because there's so many other examples where things you thought would be universal actually don't turn out to be. I think the um, you you talk about how the the the, the, the natives had like different forms of metallurgy, I think with um, gold and copper and things like that, but then they didn't do iron or steel. And you would think that given the warring nature of these trials, like iron would be such a huge help. Um, and then the, the, it's like you, there's a clear incentive to build it. There's like millions of people living here who could have built or developed this technology. Um, same with the steel, I guess. Oh, sorry, sorry. Same with um, same with the wheel. Uh, what, so like what, what, why, what is the explanation for why these things you think anybody would have come up with? It, it just didn't happen. I, you know, it's just amazing to me. I don't know. And I, 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 this is like one of those things like I think about all the time. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, it rained and I went out and I walked the dog. And um, I'm always amazed that you can uh, – there's, there's literal, you know, glistening drops of water on the crabgrass. And, I, you know, you pick it up. And uh, sometimes there's little holes eaten by insects in the crabgrass. And every now and then, if you look carefully, you'll see a drop of water in that in one of those holes, and it forms a lens, right? It, 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 you're right. And you can look through it, and you can see it, it's not a very powerful lens, by any means, but you can see it's magnified. And you think, like, how long has there been crabgrass and, um, you know, or leaves and, and water? Just forever. We've had glass forever. How is it that we had to wait to Van Leeuwenhoek or whoever it was to uh, to create lenses? I just don't get it. Or, you know, in the book, I, uh, 1491, I mentioned the moldboard plow, which is the one with a curving blade that allows you to go through the, the soil much more easily. Invented in China, you know, thousands of years ago, not if, not around in Europe till the till the 1400s. Like, come on, guys, what was what's with it? And um so you you know so there's this mysterious sort of mass stupidity <laughs> that can that kind of and one of the wonderful things about uh, globalization and trade and contact and so forth is that maybe not everybody is is as blind as you and you can you can you can learn from them. I mean that's the most wonderful thing about trade. Um, so in the case of the wheel, I mean the more amazing thing is like in Mesoamerica they had the wheel. It was on you know child's toys. Why did they develop it? And the best explanation I can get is they didn't have domestic animals. Um, and a cart then would have to be pulled by people. That would imply, to make the cart work, you'd have to cut a really good road. Whereas they did have travois, you know, the T R. I'm not sure if I, travois, T-R-A-V-O-I-S, which are these um, uh, things that you hold and they have these skids that are um, shaped like kind of like an upside down V and you, you, they're, they're, you can drag them across rough ground. You don't need a road for them. And that's what, uh, that's, that's what like um, people um, used in um, the, in the great plains and, 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 and so forth. So you look at this and you think like maybe the ultimate Sa labor savings was, I mean, this was good enough and you didn't have to build and maintain these uh, roads to make this, th th this work, you know, so maybe it was rational or just maybe they're just blinkered. I, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, and similarly with the steel, 
Um, I think there's some values involved in that. I, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, uh, one of those sword-like things they, they had in Mesoamerica called macuitos. Um, they're wooden clubs with um, obsidian blades um, on them. And they are sharp as hell. Um, you know, they're like, don't run your finger along the edge because you'll just slice it open. And an obsidian blade is sh pretty much sharper than any, um, uh, you know, iron or, 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 or steel blade. Um, and it doesn't rust nice, but it's much more brittle. Yeah, yeah right. And so, um, so you say like, okay, they're, they're in, the Spaniards are really afraid of them because a single blow from these, these heavy, sharp blades could kill a horse. I mean, they saw people like whack off the head of a horse with a you know big strong guy with a single. So they're really dangerous, um, but they're not long lasting. And um, so part of the deal was that the values around conflict were different in that conflict um, in Mesoamerica wasn't a matter of sending out foot soldiers and you know grunts to, to go and get, it was a chance for you know soldiers to get individual glory and, uh, and, and prestige. And this was associated with having these very elaborately beautiful uh, weapons that you, you know, killed people, killed people with. And so maybe this worked, not having steel worked better for, for their values and what they were trying to do in, in war than it would for Europe's. I mean, that's just a guess, but you can imagine a scenario in which it's not just blinkered, but um, an expressive of what those people were trying to do on the basis of their different values. But this is hugely speculative. There's a wonderful book by Ross Hessig called um, Aztec Warfare, in which he, uh, it's an amazing uh, book, which is like a military history of the Aztecs. It's, it's really quite interesting. And he talks about this a little bit, and he finally just says, we don't know why they, did, they didn't, but this worked for them. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of similar to when you think about China not developing gunpowder into an actual like ballistic thing or japan giving up the gun actually banning guns um the in during the edo period they they the portuguese introduced guns and the japanese the japanese used them and they said ah nope don't want them and they banned them <laughs> <laughs> this turned out to be a terrible idea when perry came in the uh, 1860s but uh for a long time uh japan and there's this thing where Supposedly, uh, under the Edo period, Japan had the longest uh, period of any nation ever without a foreign war. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I may explain the, yeah, it's concerning when you think the lack of war might make you vulnerable in certain ways. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a depressing um, thought. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, 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 Fukuyama in the end of history, he, he's obviously arguing that we should just like liberal democracy will be the um, kind of the final form of government everywhere. But th he has this like thing at the end where he's like, yeah, but maybe we need like a small war every 50 years just to make sure people remember God. how bad it can get yeah. and how to deal with it. Um, uh, anyways, so uh, uh, when the epidemic started in the new world, surely the Indians must have had some story. Maybe it was like a superstitious explanation but some way of like explaining what is happening. What, what, what was it? Like, what, how, how did they account for it? So you have to remember the germ theory of disease didn't exist at the time. So right. neither the Spaniards um, or the English or, or native people had a clear idea of, of what was going on. And in right. fact, um, both of them thought of it as essentially a spiritual event, you know, a, a, a religious event, you went into air, you know, uh, areas that were bad, and you got, uh, uh, you know, and the air was bad. And that was malaria, malaria, right? That was an example. And it so it was a, you know, and God is in control of, uh, of the whole business. Um, when the diseases came, there's a line from uh, my distant ancestor, the um, Governor Bradford of um, Plymouth Colony, who is my, you know, umpteen, umpteen, umpteenth grand. That's how waspy I am. He's actually my ancestor. Um, <laughs> is <laughs> is uh, about how God saw fit to clear the natives for for us. So he, you know, they see all of this in really religious terms, and more or less, uh, native people did too. You know, they thought, you know, all over and over again, there is this thing like we must have done something bad for this to have happened. Uh, and so this is a very powerful demoralizing thing. Um, you know, your God said either punished you or failed you. And yeah. um, this was a, this, this is one of the reasons that Christianity was able to make inroads because, you know, people with their God 
uh, was were coming and they seem to be less harmed by these diseases than people with our God. Um, now, both of them are completely misinterpreting what's going on. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, if you have that kind of spiritual explanation, it makes sense for you to say, think, well, maybe, maybe I should adopt their God. Yeah, yeah, this is super fascinating. There's been a lot of books written in the last few decades about why civilizations collapse. You know, there's, um, there's Joseph Tainter's book, there's Jared Diamond's book. Do you feel like any of them actually do a good job of explaining how these different Indian societies collapsed over time? Uh, no, um, well, not the ones that I've I've, I've read. Um, and the reason there's two reasons uh, for for that. Um, one is, I mean, it's not really a mystery if you have a society that's epidemiologically naive, and um, you know, smallpox sweeps in, kills thirty percent of you. You know, measles kills in, kills a ten percent of you, and this all happens in a short period of time. That's you know, uh, that's really tough. I mean, look what. COVID killed one, you know, million people in the United States. That's one 330th of the population. Um, and it, it wasn't even particularly, you know, the most economically vital part of the population. It wasn't, yeah, yeah it wasn't kids. It was, uh, you know, elderly uh, people like my aunt, um, you know, so I don't, I, I hope I'm not sounding callous when I'm describing it like a demographer. Um, and because, uh, you know, I, I don't mean it that way. Uh, but it caused enormous, you know, economic damage and, you know, social conflict and so forth. Now imagine something that's, you know, 30 or 40 times worse than that, and you have no explanation for it at all. Um, it's kind of not a surprise to me that this is a, you know, super challenge. What's actually uh, amazing is the number of uh, nations that survived um, and came up with ways to deal with this incredible loss. Um, and that goes to the second issue, which is um, that it's sort of weird to talk about collapse in ways that you sometimes do. Like both of them talk about the Maya collapse, but there's 40, no, 30 million Maya people still there. Um, they were uh, never really conquered by the, the Spaniards. The, the, the Spaniards are still waging giant wars in Yucatan in the 1590s. Um, you know, when you go one time, uh, this is in the, now in the, the, the uh, in the early uh, 21st century, um, I went with uh, my son to uh, Chiapas, which is the southernmost uh, Mexican province, and that is where you probably heard about the Comandante Zero, and you know, there's rebellions are going on. And uh, we were looking at some Maya ruins, and it was, they were too beautiful, and I stayed too long. We were driving back through the night um, on these terrible roads. And uh, we got stopped by uh, s some of these guys with guns. And uh, I was like, oh God, you know, not only have I, you know, got myself into this, I got my son into this. And the guy comes and he looks at us and says, who are you? And I say, we're American tourists. And he just gets looked this disgusted look. He says, go on. And I, 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 I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you know what, you know, the journalist in me takes over and says, well, what do you mean? Just go on. And he says, we're, we're, we're hunting for Mexicans. And I drive about a mile. I think, wait a minute, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> and that, those are Maya. Um, you know, the, all those uh, guys were Maya people still fighting against the, uh, the, 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 the Spaniards. So it's kind of funny to say that their, their, their society collapsed when they have, you know, their Maya radio stations, their Maya schools, their, you know, their people speaking Maya in their home. It's true they don't have giant castles any, in, anymore, but it's, you know, it's, it's odd to think of that as, a, as collapse. They seem like highly successful people who have dealt pretty well with uh, a lot of foreign incursions. So there's this whole aspect of what do you mean collapse? Uh, and you, you see that in um, Against the Grain, the James Scott book, where, you know, yeah. you say, what do you mean barbarians? These guys have it pretty good. And, <laughs> you know, if, if you're an average Maya person, you know, uh, you know, working as a farmer under these uh, the 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 purview of these elites in the big cities probably wasn't all that great. And uh, after collapse, you were probably better off. So you know, so all of that I feel like uh, is important in in this discussion of collapse. And I, I think it's hard to point to collapses that don't either have very clear exterior causes. Um, or are, you know, really 
collapses of the environment and particularly of the environmental sort that um, that are pictured in in books like uh, Diamond's Class. He talks like Easter Island. Um, and the striking thing about that is we know pretty much what happened to all those trees. Easter Island is this little speck of land, um, you know, in the middle of the ocean. Dutch guys come there. It's the only wood around, you know, forever. They cut down all the trees to use it for boat repair, uh, ship repair. And um, and they enslave most of the people um, who are living there. I and mean, we know pretty much what happened. There's no mystery about it. <laughs> Why did the British government and the king keep subsidizing and giving sanction to the Virginia Company, even after it was clear that this is not especially profitable and basically like half the people that are going are dying? Why didn't they just like stop? That, that's a really good question. That's a super good um, question. I don't really know if we have a satisfactory answer because it was so stupid um, for them to keep doing that. It was such a loss for so so long. Um, so you have to say they were thinking not purely economically. Um, and part of it is uh, the the backers of the Virginia Company in sort of classic VC style when things were going bad, they lied about it, and they and they're burning through their cash. They did these rosy presentations, and they said it's going to be great. We just need this extra uh, money, um, you know, kind of the way that Uber did with, um, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then there's this tremendous burn rate, and now the company's in tremendous tr uh, trouble because these. It turns out that it's really expensive to, to provide all these uh, cabs and, uh, and 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 do all this stuff, and the cheaper prices that made me people like me really happy about it um, are vanishing. Um, so. You know, I think uh, future business studies will st uh, look at those rosy presentations from Uber and, and see that they have a kind of analogy to the ones that were done with the uh, Virginia company. Um, a second thing is that um, there is this dogged belief um, kind of based on, um, uh, you know, inabilities to uh, understand longitude and, uh, and, and so forth, that the... Americas were far narrower than they actually are. And there's a, I think I reproduced this in 1493. There's, there's all kinds of maps in Britain at the time showing this little skinny, you know, Philippines like islands. And there's a thought that, you know, you just go up the Chesapeake and you go just a couple hundred miles and you're going to get to the Pacific and to, to China. So there's this constant searching for a passage to China through this uh, thought to be very narrow. And Sir Francis Drake and people like that had shown that there was a West Coast. And so they thought the whole thing was this, you know, narrow Panama-like uh, inlet. And so there's right. so there's this geographical uh, confusion. And, um, fin and, uh, it, uh, and finally, there's the fact that the Spaniards had found all this gold and silver, which is an ideal yeah. commodity because it's not perishable. It's small. You can put it on your ship and bring it back. And it's it, it's just great in every way. It's money, essentially. They, they You dig up money in the hills. And there's this longstanding belief there's got to be more of that and um, in, in, in the Americas. We just need to, to find out. So there's always that hope. And, and finally, there's this kind of imperial bragging rights. Um, you know, we can't be the only guys without a, a colony. And you, you see that with, um, with you know, later in the 19th century with, uh, you know, Germany becomes a nation. And one of the first things it does is, says, you know, looks for pieces of Africa that, that, uh, that the rest of Europe hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, uh, claimed and, and sets up its own, you know, mini colonial empire. So there's this kind of keeping up with the Joneses um, at, at aspect. It just seems to be sort of deep in the uh, European ruling class <laughs> that you got to have an empire, you know, uh, in, in this weird way that, you know, uh, seems very culturally part of it. And I, I guess it's the same for many other places. Um, you know, as soon as you get, a, you, as soon as you feel like you have a state together, you want to annex uh, other, other things. Uh, you see that over and over again, all over the world. So, uh, so that's part of it. So all those things, I think, contribute to it. This uh, out and out lying, this delusion, and and various delusions plus uh, hubris. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems um, it seems that the colonial envy has probably today spread to China. I I don't know too much about it, but I hear that the Silk Road stuff they're doing is not especially economically wise. It just. Uh, yeah, but it is this kind of like you have this impulse if you're a nation trying to rise that, uh, you know, I, I got to go. I got to go over there. I got to go, go over there and show what a big uh, guy I am. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
speaking of China and speaking of silver, I want to ask you about um, the silver trade. So excuse another tortured analogy, but when I was reading that chapter where you're describing how the Spanish silver was ending up in China, you know, I'm, I'm reading this and I'm looking at you're describing how the Ming dynasty, it, it, it caused too much inflation. There were people needed a reliable medium of exchange. And then they had to give up real goods from China just in order to get this silver, which is just a medium of exchange. It's not, it's not creating more apples, right? Um, and I was thinking about this. And I was like, um, this sounds a bit like Bitcoin today in the sense, obviously to a much smaller magnitude, but in the sense that um, a, a, you're using up goods, like, I mean, it's a small amount of electricity, all things considered, but like you're having to use up like um, real energy in order to con construct this medium of exchange. And maybe somebody can claim that this is necessary because of um, inflation or some other uh, policy mistake, like you can compare it to like Ming Dynasty or something. Um, but well, what do you think this analogy basically that there's a similar thing where real goods are being exchanged for just uh, medium exchange? That's really interesting. The I mean, on some level, that's the way that money works, right? You know, I go into a store and I, you know, Starbucks and I buy a coffee and I hand them a piece of paper with some drawings on it and they get, they hand me an actual coffee in return for a piece of paper. So, you know, so that the mysteriousness of money is kind of amazing. And, and there's history is, of course, replete with examples of things that people took very seriously as money that to us seems very silly, like the cowrie shell or uh, in the, the island of Yap, you know, where they uh, had giant stones um, and those are money and nobody ever carried them around. You transferred the ownership of the stone from one person to another person to buy something. So, you know, I would get some you know, coconuts or gourds or whatever, and now you own that stone on the hill. Um, so there's a, a, tr a tremendous sort of mysteriousness about the human willingness to assign value to arbitrary things, such as in Bitcoin's case, strings of uh, zeros and ones. Um, so I, I, so that part of it make uh, make makes sense to me. What the extraordinary thing is that uh, when the effort to create a medium of exchange ends up costing you significantly, which is what you're talking about. And we were talking about in, in, in China where, um, where people got uh, uh, a medium exchange, but they had to work hugely to, to, to get the money. I don't have to work hugely to get a dollar bill, right? Uh, to get the dollar bill. It's, it's not like I'm, you know, cutting down a tree and, uh, you know, smashing the papers to pulp and, you know, printing the, the, this, um, you're right, right. And that's what they're kind of doing in, in China. And that's to a lesser extent, uh, what you're doing in, in, in Bitcoin. So I hadn't thought about this, but it, 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 and the Bitcoin in this case is using computer cycles and energy. And, um, to me, it's absolutely, uh, it, it's extraordinary, uh, the degree to which people are, who are Bitcoin miners are willing to upend their lives to get cheap energy. So um, a guy I know has, uh, is, is talking about setting up small nuclear plants, you know, as, as part of his idea for climate change. And, and, he, and to set them up, he wants to set them up in like really weird remote areas. And I was saying, who'd be your customers? And he said, Bitcoin people would move to these nowhere places so they could have like these pocket nukes to privately supply their um, Bitcoin uh, ha habits. And I just thought, that is really crazy to you know completely upend your life for to create something that you hope is a medium of exchange that will allow you to buy the things that you're giving up. Uh, right, right. And so there, there's, a, there's a kind of funny aspect to, to this. And that was partly what was happening in, uh, in, in China is that they were, um, unfortunately, China is very large. And so they were able to send off um, all, all this stuff to Mexico so that they could get the silver to pay their taxes. But it was definitely weak in the country. Yeah, well, actually, I, the, the thing you're talking about, in some sense, it's uh, El Salvador actually tried it. They were trying to set up a Bitcoin city next to this volcano, or they were going to use the, I guess, a geothermal from the uh, from the volcano in order to like uh, make people come there to mine cheap Bitcoin um, or mine it cheaply. S staying on the theme of China, w do you think the profits were more correct or the wizards more correct for that given time period? Because you have the introduction of, as you describe them in the book, 
potato, corn, uh, maize, sweet potatoes, and then this drastically increases population. But then again, it reaches a carrying capacity. So, and then obviously there's other kinds of ecological problems this causes, as you describe in the book. So it, 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 is this... Um, is, is, is this, you think, uh, at that time, uh, uh, evidence of the wizard worldview that you had this potato and then, you know, population balloons? Or is it, the, are the prophets like, oh, no, no, the carrying capacity will catch up to us eventually? Okay, so let me um, interject here uh, for those members of your audience who uh, don't know what, what we're talking about. I wrote this book, The Wizard and the Prophet, and there's, there's about these sort of two camps um, that have been around for a long time regarding about how we think about energy, resources, the environment, and all those issues. And... The wizards, you know, you can call them, that's my name for them. Um, Stuart Brand calls them druids. Um, and uh, which is, in fact, originally the title was going to be involved the word druid, but they, uh, my editor said, uh, nobody knows what a druid is. <laughs> so, so I had to change it to wizards. Anyway, um, you know, say that science and technology properly applied can allow you to produce your way out of these environmental dilemmas. You turn on the science machine, essentially, and we can, you know, we can escape these kind of um, dilemmas. And the prophets say, no, there's, 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 there, that natural systems are governed by um, laws, um, and there's an inherent carrying capacity or limits or planetary boundaries, or, you know, there's a bunch of different names for them that say that you can't do more than so much. Um, and so what happened in China is that um, European crops came over and um, China's basic, one of China's sort of basic uh, geographical conditions is it's, um, you know, something like 20% of the Earth's, you know, habitable surface area, or, or it has 20% of the world's population, excuse me, um, has a, you know, appreciable chunk of the world's surface area, but it only has seven or 8% of the world's above ground fresh water. There's no big giant lakes like we have um, in the Great Great Lakes. Um, and there's only a couple of big rivers, the Yangtze and the Huanghe or Yellow River. And the main staple crop in China has to be grown in swimming pools. That's, uh, you know, rice. And so there's this paradox, which is how do you keep people fed with rice um, in a country that has very little water? And, um, you know, if you want a shorthand hist uh, history of China, that's it. So, okay. So, and, and prophets believe that there's these planetary um, uh, boundaries. And so um, in history, these are typically called Malthusian limits after Malthus. And the, you know, the question is, with the available technology at a certain time, um, you know, how many people can you feed before there's misery? And the great thing about uh, history and this sort of thing is it provides um, evidence for both sides. Because in the short run, what happened when American crops come in is that the potato, uh, the sweet potato and maize corn are the first staple crops that are dry land crops that can be grown in the western half of China, which is very, very um, dry and, and, and mountainous and has, uh, and has little water. And um, population soars uh, immediately afterwards, but so does social unrest, um, misery, and, 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 and so forth. In the long run, um, it becomes adaptable and, um, and China becomes this wealthy and powerful, uh, powerful nation in the short run, which is not so short. It's a couple of centuries. It's, uh, it really causes tremendous chaos and, and, and suffering. So which, <laughs> you know, it, it provides evidence, if you like, for both sides. Uh, one is it increases human capacity and the second, uh, unquestionably about it, increases human numbers, increases possibility. The second is it leads to tremendous uh, erosion, land degradation and human suffering. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's that, that's a thick coin with the two sides. Um, but by the way, so I realize I haven't uh, gone to the, uh, all, all the wizard and prophet questions, and there's a lot of them. So I certainly have, you know, uh, time. I'm enjoying the, the conversation. One of the weird things is that um, about podcasts is that, as far as I can tell, the average podcast interviewer that I, is far more knowledgeable and uh, thoughtful than the average sort of mainstream uh, journalist um, interviewer it had. I, I just find that amazing. I don't, under I don't understand it. So I think you guys should be hired by the, uh, you know, they should switch roles or something. Um, so yeah, maybe. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to be asked these interesting uh, questions about subjects that I find fascinating. Oh, no, it's, it's my pleasure to get to talk to you and, uh, mm -hmm. and to have, uh, get to ask these questions. So, so let me ask about the Wizard and the Prophet. So one of uh, I, I just recently had Will McCaskill uh -huh. on. He's um, okay, so you're familiar. And then we were talking about what ends up mattering most in history. And I asked him, 
um, you know, like Norman Borlaw, it said that he saved a billion lives. But then uh, McCaskill pointed out that that well, that's an exceptional result. Um, the, he doesn't think the technology is that contingent. So if Borla hadn't existed, somebody else would have discovered what he discovered uh, about you know short wheat stocks, anyways. And then so counterfactually, in a world where Borla doesn't exist, it's not like a billion people die. Maybe a couple million more die until the next guy comes around. That's what that was his view. What would do? Do you agree, or what, what is your response? In some, to some extent, I I agree. You know, it's 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 very likely that um, you know, in the absence of of one scientist, some other scientist would have uh, d d discovered this. And I mentioned in the book, in fact, that there's a guy named uh, Swami Nathan, um, a, a, a remarkable um, Indian scientist who is kind of you know a step behind him. Um, you know, and and you know did mu did much of the same work, and you know, um, at the same time. Um, the individual qualities of Borlaug are, are really quite remarkable. I mean, the the amount, uh, the insane amount of work and dedication that he that he did um, is really hard to imagine. And the fact is that um, he was going against many of the breeding, uh, plant breeding dogmas of his day. That all and uh, that all matters in his insistence on um, feeding the poor. You know, it was a that was it. So he did re remarkable things. Yes, I think some of those same things would have been discovered. It would have been a huge deal if it had taken twenty years later. Um, I mean, that would have been a lot of people who would have been hurt in the in 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 the interim because, at the same time, things like um, the end of colonialism um, and the discovery of antibiotics and so forth has was leading to a real population rise and um, the amount of human misery that would have um, occurred is really frightening to, 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 to think about. Um, so in some sense, I think he's, uh, he, he, he's right, but I wouldn't be so glib about those couple of million people. Yeah, and, and another thing you might be concerned about is that given the hostile attitude that people had towards the Green Revolution right after, like if if the if the actual implementation of these um, the, the different strains in Pakistan and India if that hadn't been delayed it's it, it's not that weird to imagine a scenario where the government there are just like totally won over by the profits and they they decide not to um, implant this technology at all if you think about like what happened to nuclear in the seventies in many different countries right like maybe something similar could have happened to um, maybe something similar could have happened to the green revolution. So right. it's important, it's important to beat the profit. Uh, maybe that's not the right, correct way to say it, but one way you could put it is it's important like to beat the profits, but like before the policies are passed, you have to like get, get the technology in there. You're right. Or else you want, you, you know, you want to, um, listen to the, you know, in my opinion, this is just my personal opinion. You want to listen to the profits about what the problems are. They're incredible about diagnosing, uh, problems and very frequently they're right um about those things There's the social issues about the green revolution dead right they're completely right i don't know if you um then adopt their solutions um it's a little bit like my feeling with my editors my editors often will point out problems in the manuscript <laughs> i almost never agree with their solution but they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're correct about the diagnoses um you know the 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 fact is that borlaug did develop this um this wheat that came into India, but it's also a fact that it probably wouldn't have been nearly as successful if Swaminathan hadn't um, changed that wheat to make it more acceptable to um, the 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 um, culture of India. Um, right. That was one of the most important parts of, for me of this book was was when I went to Tamil Nadu and I listened to this and I thought, oh, I never heard about this part where they they took Mexican wheat and they made it into Indian wheat. Um, you know, I don't even know if Borlaug ever knew they really grasped that they really had done that. By the way, a person for you to interview is, uh, there's a, yes, it's Marcy Baranski, excuse me, M, uh, B A R A N S K I. And she's got a, a green, a, a forthcoming book about a, the history of the green revolution. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, she sounds great. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading it. So here's a plug for her. <laughs> so if we apply that particular story to today, I mean, it, it, are, let's say that we had regulatory agencies like the FDA back then that are as powerful. We're as powerful back then as they are now. Do you think it's possible that the green, like the, these new advances, would have just dithered in some approval process that took years or decades to complete? Um, and, or like, 
if you just um, back test our current uh, process for implementing technological solutions, are, are you concerned that something like the Green Revolution could not have happened or would have taken way too long or something? It's possible. I mean, you know, bureaucracies can always go um, can always uh, go rogue, and government is faced with this kind of impossible problem. So, like, let let us take take for example, um, there's a there's a current big political argument about um, whether the former president uh, Trump should have taken these uh, documents, you know, top secret documents to um, to his house in Florida and done whatever he wanted to, and. Let us say, just for the moment, let's accept the argument that these were like super secret documents and should not have been in a basement. Let's just say that's true. Um, it, it, but we don't have, uh, and the re and he says, well, whatever the president says is declassified is de declassified. And let us say that's true. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just talking about it as a paper. Um, obviously, that would be bad. You would not want to have that kind of informal process if for you can imagine all kinds of things that you wouldn't want to have that inf kind of informal process in, in place. So then the um, but nobody has ever imagined that you would do that because it's sort of nutty um, in, in that scenario. And uh, you, you so then you say you write a law and you create a bureaucracy for declassifying and immediately you add more, you know, uh, delay, you make things um, harder, you add in the problems of um, of, of um, the bureaucrats getting too much power, you know, all the things that you, you do. So you have this, uh, this problem with government, which is that people occasionally do things you would never imagine as, you know, completely screwy. And so then you put in regulatory mechanisms to stop them from, 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 from doing that, and that impedes everybody else. And so in the case of the FDA, it was founded um, in the 30s when some person um, produced this thing called elixir sulfanamide that killed hundreds of people. It was a flat out poison. And, um, and you know, hundreds of people died. You would think like, who would do that? But somebody did that and they created this entire review mechanism to make sure it never happened again, which introduced delay. And then something with thalidomide, um, you know, which they did stop here because uh, you know, the people who invented that didn't even do the most cursory kind of uh, check. So you have this constant um, problem. So I'm sympathetic to um, the, the, the dilemma faced by government here in which you either um, let through really bad things done by occasional people or you screw up everything for everybody else. And, you know, it's kind of like this, I, I was phrasing it crudely, but I think you see the kind of trade-off. So the question is, how well can you manage this trade-off? And so I would argue um, that sometimes it's well managed and sometimes it's not. Like it's kind of remarkable that we got vaccines produced by an entirely new mechanism, you know, in record time, um, and they passed pretty rigorous safety reviews, and they were given to millions and millions and millions of people with very very few negative effects. I mean, that's a real a regulatory triumph there, right? So that would be the counterexample. You know, you have this new thing that you can um, feed people and, and, and so forth, and they, they let it through very quickly. On the other hand, you have um, things like genetically modified salmon and uh, trees, which as far as I can tell, they've done, especially for the, for the chestnuts, extraordinary efforts to, to test. And I'm sure that those are gonna be in regulatory hell for, uh, for, for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, you know, I, I just feel I have this, um, there's this great problem um, in, in that the, the, the flaws that you identify, are, I, I would like to back up and say, this is a problem sort of inherent to government. And, um, you know, that, uh, that there is always, uh, you know, they're always protecting us against the edge case and the edge case sets the rules and, there, and that ends up, um, you know, unless you're very careful, um, making it very difficult for everybody else. Yeah. Um, and the vaccines are an interesting example here because one of the things you talk about in the book, one of the possibilities with regards to climate change is that you could have some kind of geoengineering. You're right. And I think you mentioned in the book that, well, as long as it could just be like if even one country tries this, then they can effectively for relatively modest amount of money, they could change the atmosphere. Um, but then I look at the failure of any government to approve human challenge trials. Yes. Something that seems like an obvious thing to do and would have um, would have potentially saved hundreds of thousands of lives during COVID by speeding up the vaccine approval. Um, and then I wonder maybe the collaboration among 
the international collaboration is strong enough that something like geoengineering actually couldn't happen because something like human challenge trials didn't happen. So let me give a plug here for a, a fun novel by my friend uh, Neil Stevenson uh, called Termination Shock, which is about uh, some rich person just do just doing it and um, just doing enge geoengineering, and um, the fact that it's actually not against the law. Um, to fire off rockets into the stratosphere. <laughs> uh, in, in his case, it's a giant gun that shoots, uh, shoots shells into the, uh, full of sulfur into the upper atmosphere. Um, and I guess the, the question is, what time scale do you think is appropriate for, for um, all, all, all this? I feel quite confident that there will be um, geoengineering trials um, within the next 10 years. Uh, is that fast enough? Um, you know, that's that's a real ju uh, judgment call. I think people like David Keith and the other advocates uh, for geoengineering would have said it should have happened already. And that's way, way too slow. People who are you know super anxious uh, uh, about moral hazard and the precautionary principles would say that's way, way too fast. So you have these different um, uh, constituencies. So be, it's it's hard for me to think off the top of my head of an example where these regulatory agencies have actually totally throttled something um, in a long lasting way, as opposed to delaying it for 10 years. 10 years is not, not I, don't, I don't mean to imply that that's nothing, um, but, uh, but really killing off something. Is there an example if you can think of a, of a thing that was uh, killed nuclear? off? Well, I mean, that, it, it's very dependent on where you think, uh, where, where you think it would have been otherwise. Like yeah. people say, maybe it was, it was just bound to be the state, but. I think in that case, um, that was a very uh, successful case of, um, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, of regulatory capture in which um, the opponents of the, um, of, of the technology successfully um, created uh, this crazy so the, the one of the weird things about nuclear stuff is this isn't this is not actually in the book i actually wrote a whole long section about it in the book and i cut it out because it felt like it was just too much in the weeds um if you have um a coal plant uh they have environmental rules and the rules are based based on a threshold principle that they you you set a safe threshold for the emission of particulates and you know uh, other other things um and as long as you're below that threshold you're fine Nuclear power has um, a thing for its main type of, you know, quote, pollution, which is radiation. What is it's called the linear no threshold model. And what it says is that you have to reduce the radiation to the maximum extent practicable, you know, and that is set by essentially, um, you know, if, if your nuclear power is way cheaper than coal power, which it is, um, that means you have more profit so that you can spend more money yeah. <laughs> on, on reducing it. Right. And so you're, you're, you know, you're going ever further in the, on the road to diminishing returns. So you have a completely different regulatory standard um, for nuclear. In, I'm talking about this country um, than you, than you do for coal. And so you have this bizarre fact that coal power plants emit more radiation than nuclear plant plants do because of the <laughs> residual radiation in the coal that's dug up from right. underneath the earth. And so there you have, um, you know, a, a, a case of, um, you know, a very strange case of regulatory capture in which you have a completely inconsistent set of safety standards, you know, across different um, parts of the same same industry. And the question to me, and sort of an empirical question is how common is that? Or is that this weird thing that's happened to nuclear, that's happened to nuclear? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so assume that you're, let's say you're in the 1960s, and that you are a philanthropic donor who is interested, let's say you're like the 1960s version of an effective altruist, you're interested in doing the most good possible. And in retrospect, it's clear that you should have funded Borlaw. I mean, counterfactually, he still does it. But you know, let's just say um, your his, his work depends on your funding. What, like, how, how could you have identified work like that? Is that, is there some criteria that is broadly applicable where you could have identified his work in Mexico using it? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, that's the greatest good for greatest number question. And you know, right. to do that, you would have to say, what are the biggest uh, problems facing the, the planet? And then presumably if, if you're William McCaskill or somebody like that, you say all lives are equal. And so what is the, the thing that's most affecting the most number of lives? Um, and in that case, it's probably clean drinking water. Um, right. I think that's the biggie. Um, and that means, um, funding, um, urban in, 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 in for funding primarily urban in infrastructure for, for, for water and setting up, um, 
some kind of foundation or some independent agency that's not insulated with it, that's insulated from government to, to actually keep those go water systems going. Um, that would be my answer on, on, on that, uh, uh, which would be, how, that's how you would do it. I think you would try to figure out, you know, what are the bare necessities? What's killing more people than anything else? And uh, in 1960, it's probably food and water. And so uh, food is actually, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, once they get interested in Borlaug, actually does a pretty good job of promoting it. And there's the creation of the CIGAR system. It could always use more uh, use water is completely neglected. And um, actually, I would I would channel it towards water. Interesting. Okay. Um, I want to know, I'm going to name two trends, and I want to know what you think these two imply for um, the debate between wizards and prophets in the future. So one of the trends is declining researcher productivity in terms of how many new important advancements each researcher is able to make. There's evidence that shows that, over, that that's like exponentially decaying. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong that, that they think. And the reason is um, that, you know, in the areas that I'm familiar with, you know, there's there's two things that are that are that are that are that are, that are going on. One is like in particle physics, um, it's harder and harder to make discoveries because the the, um, the the your 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 penalty of your own success. You're pushing harder and harder into in things, and to really get to where you're going, it's just incredibly expensive. So so that's a natural phenomenon. It's not anything really to worry about because you know, what do you want to do? Undo the past 50 years of, <laughs> of success in particle physics? People like Murray Gell-Mann could do a huge amount because there's no, there, there, we didn't know anything. So you're seeing just plain old diminishing returns. The second thing though, and I think is, is something important, is that um, in fields like agricultural research, the vast majority of research is in a, sm a bunch of narrow areas, wheat, rice, you know, um, maize and so forth. There's all kinds of alternative crops that um, could be, that are hardly looked at and could be really important, particularly in a time of climate change, when we are going to have to have an, a much more resilient um, and, uh, and varied agricultural system to deal with the uncertainties of, of climate change. So I'd like to, there's hardly any research done in agroforestry. All those um, crops are essentially wild. Um, you know, how many people are, you know, except for William Powell looking at chestnut, there's practically no real genetic research into um, increasing tree crop productivity. Um, there's also not nearly enough research in even, you know, things like cassava, um, where you could, you know, do a huge amount because there's just, I always tell, when I talk to people, I always say, go to these other crops. They're really, really important. Um, they're going to be even more important in the future. And there's virtually no research on them. And you can make giant strides rather than being the person who's trying to increasingly optimize wheat, something that's already been optimized by 10,000 people. So part of it is that there is this uh, channeling of people into fields that are already well trodden, and I think that you can see that in many, many um, er, er, areas of, of of research. That would be a partial answer to that question. I see. Yeah. So I was going to ask um, if there's declining uh, research productivity, maybe there's less uh, rabbits you can just keep pulling out of the hat, like Borla did. But let me just ask instead. Uh, or s similarly, uh, with regards to increasing the productivity of um, trees in order to potentially deal with climate change, what is, in the book you speculate about C4 um, uh, photosynthesis? You know, I, that's just an example of the kind of thing that you could do. What what is the status of that? Are are you optimistic about that? Or yeah, they're plugging away. Um, you know, it's a huge, difficult problem, but it's extraordinarily interesting. Um, and to get something like C4 rice would be just an absolutely gigantic, uh, uh, you know, increase in, 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 in productivity. But even in drylands areas, um, there's this f method of agriculture that's used in uh, West Africa and places like Northern Mexico, which is silvopastoral, where you have, you know, ruminants, cows and, you know, so, and so forth, and trees. And the two create a system that is way easier on the land, uses way less water, and is um, almost as productive as uh, as annual crops. And uh, almost no research is, has, has gone into that. You know, that would be an, another example of a kind of, of thing that you could do that I would argue, you know, would have a much greater impact than um, the person trying to get, you know, the the the, cherry, the latest flavor of cherry flavored nose drops or something, which is what a huge amount of research is in. Um, there have been people speculating recently that environmental contaminants are leading to a host of health, bad outcomes in health in the West, especially obesity. 
How plausible do you think this is? Well, I guess um, I always wonder about the mechanism. What would be the what would be the mechanism that these tiny trace amounts of uh, these these compounds have in them, and how come as our environment has generally gotten cleaner, obesity has risen? So I'm immediately skeptical uh, of this. One of the issues here is that you're dealing with problems that are on the very limits of our ability to measure them. Um, you know, you're dealing with if you're looking for these things, obviously they have very very long term effects. Um, whatever they are, um, how are you going to actually ascertain attain that? Um, and people who make very strong claims based on uh, uh, effects without a mechanism that are at the very limits of our ability to measure, uh, that just doesn't seem like a good, uh, uh, all that promising to me. Yeah. So it's not the, impossible, the, the, not impossible, but, <laughs> but the claims yeah. you see, I think like, how could they possibly know that? Yeah. So one of these people, they're, they're good friends of mine, slime old, time old. They're anonymous bloggers on the internet. And they set up um, something called the potato diet. It was like a four week study. And I, I thought you might have interesting thoughts on this, given the, the chapters in your book that were dedicated to the humble potato and its impact on uh, the world. Um, so the, basically, they only ate potatoes for four weeks. And as you talk about in the book, potatoes have a bunch of micronutrients that um, they're weirdly good for you. Here. If you're going to do that, use potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then people lost a lot of weight. What? Uh, so is this something you would have expected? What, what, what do you think of this, like, uh, just recapitulating Irish history? Well, the Irish history is uh, is is both analogous and not analogous, because it is true. They, they ate nothing but it. But also those people were super, you know, vigorously physically exercising because they were out in the fields with really poor um, tools. So, um it's a really different situation from, you know, you and me who, no matter how many times you go to the gym, that's not the same as working for 10 hours in the, in the fields. Um, and um, also the epidemiological environment is so crazy different. And all those people in Ireland only live to the age of 40 anyway. Right? So, so um, there's a whole host of um, studies that show that people who eat, take extreme diets, almost always they work. Um, you know, nothing but beans, nothing but this, uh, it, and people lose a lot of weight in the in, in the short term. Um, it's really difficult to show that that it's possible to keep it off, and it's possible for people to maintain these kinds of diets for um, long periods of time. Right, right. I, I I remember that part of the book where you have that uh, passage from Adam Smith, where he's commenting on how all these Irish people. They only eat potatoes, but they all of them seem so healthy <laughs> yeah. and beautiful. Right. Well, they're also out in the fields and not in London, right? Adam Smith's looking at Edinburgh and, and places like that, which are the most unhealthy places on the planet. Say you have no discount rate. So you think future people matter exactly as much as current people. Yeah. Um, does that shift you more towards the profit side or the wizard side? Um, not, not in absolute terms, but like from where you're starting out. I have to say... Um, I'm uncomfortable with this uh, that entire time reason. This is something that William McCaskill talks about. And I think I don't think from what I've read of his, he takes seriously enough the question that we don't know what those future people will want. Um, you know, there's uh, no question that what we want today would have seemed abhorrent to people, you know, most people 1800, you know, in, in 1800. So the idea that we um, can have any or any other idea other than they probably want to be alive, it seems much more questionable than 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 I, I think um, than, than than I think it, it does. Um, and so there's two ways to look at it. One is the the wizards say, let's you know we have an idea. They're going to want to live in this you know a certain kind of um, utopia and live their longest lives and uh, and uh, have the maximum possible physical comfort, which is generally what. The, the, the wizards say the prophets is, uh, might say, um, and that seems perfectly reasonable to me. Um, but the prophets might say, well, we should be more epistemologically, you know, uh, humble. Say we don't know what they want to. Let's preserve as many options as possible for them. Um, that doesn't seem crazy. I, I, I personally probably leaned more to the wizard on this. But if a prophet said that to me, I wouldn't say, oh, you're wrong. <laughs> Because that's the same argument about um, burying nuclear waste, which I also think is very powerful, that we should probably not bury it in some system where it can't be, un, you know, the, in, uh, gotten rid of for 10,000 years. We should just make sure that we uh, can k track it for a couple hundred years and then there will be more options for people 200 years from now than there are today. Okay, so what is wrong with the basic um, free market objection to the carrying capacity arguments, which is which goes like, Okay, let's say we do reach the ends of some resource, then its price will just increase 
until you reach some sort of sustainable equilibrium and people will just decrease their consumption or keep it constant or something. So if it, you know, let's say with meat, people are concerned that the developing world is, uh, as it gets richer, people are going to eat more meat. But if it's true that it consumes 10 times the energy and the grain that's just like feeding them directly, then, you know, that'll be represented in the price and like, you know, and, and then so the, the, the trend lines might be mistaken because the price of meat will increase or something. So, yeah, no, I, th it's, I think that's a very powerful argument. Um, but the, the problem with it to, to my mind is, um, that the kinds of things that we're talking about, or we care about for carrying capacity, you know, aren't things like, you know, bubble gum, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or like, <laughs> they're things like food, water, energy. And those have never, you know, as far as I know, been governed by anything remotely resembling the free market, right? They, they aren't today. They never have been in the past. Um, so it seems to me an interesting thought experiment to imagine what would happen if you truly had a, a free market for the, for for those things, but it also seems uh, pointless because uh, the, the the if I had to bet, I'd bet that it would be the same way it's been for the last couple thousand years, and we don't have a free market, and we already have all kinds of weird distortions because of that. You know, from if your point of view, you know, the tremendous amount of food that's wasted, the crazy arrangements we have for water in the uh, this of the similarly the, these like ludicrous things like. Um, I have this idea you're in Texas, right? So you have this thing where Texas has like its own independent grid, so it can't trade energy with other um, states that are nearby. Yeah. Like, what the heck is that? Right. You know, <laughs> that's really crazy. And there's, you know, I mean, I don't want me to pick on Texas, but it's just something I was, uh, I was thinking. Of. There's equally crazy things all over the place. The possibility of building long distance um, high high tension lines because um, you know various states have just arbitrarily imposed rules that make it impossible. There's all kinds of crazy things going on. So um, the, the, I, I guess I think like what you're saying is for, it's very likely to, to be true in a system that will never exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, because um, it's okay. kind of a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. That, I, that, that seems an actual note to close on. Um, uh, th this is extra. I mean, I learned so much from the books and I learned so much from talking to you. So I, I really, uh, I really enjoy this. Um, the books again that we talked about were 1491, 1493, The Wizard and the Prophet for, um, for anybody interested. Um, and then is there any other place that you would like to direct um, viewers who might want to check out your work? I guess, you know, stay tuned for the, uh, my book about the West, which should be coming out next year if I'm at all lucky. Okay. And uh, I'd love to have you back on again when it comes out. Oh, sure. We can talk about the, the Texas has got an amazing history. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. One of the things I learned about was the Comanche. Whew, Russ customers and uh, <laughs> their role in Texas history is just just totally eye poppingly amazing. So that's actually a very fun part. Too. So we can talk about your Texas roots. <laughs> we we'll, we'll definitely will. Um, thanks so much for coming on, Charles. Sure, pleasure. Nice to meet you. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed that episode, I would really, really, really appreciate it if you could share it. This is still a pretty small podcast. So it is a huge help when any one of you shares an episode that you like. Post it on Twitter, send it to friends who you think might like it, put it in your group chats, just let the word go forth. It helps out a ton. Many thanks to my amazing editor, Graham Besselou, for producing this podcast, and to Mia Ayana for creating the amazing transcripts that accompany each episode. Uh, which have helpful links, and you can find them at the link in the description below. Remember to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. Cheers. See you next time.